Welcome to the Mystery College Podcast. Today, we'll be talking with Maxwell Lewis Latham. He's translated the Corpus, Corpus Hermeticum and is very versed as an editor, Jules Craftsperson, and very well versed in Latin, Greek, among other classical languages. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Jake. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. Um, can you share with the audience a little bit about yourself? Like what got you into doing classical translations, hermetic works? What what started you on this path? Well, this is a very long, long story, but to cut it short, it was meeting my good friend and former boss, Tanya Robinson. And I was working in a shop in Cambridge. I just graduated. I was studying archaeology and, and uh, I was a practicing archaeologist and I'd studied Latin and uh, anyway, a friend of hers heard me talking about uh, the pagan crucifix that I used to wear, um, which I picked up a biker meat. And I said, oh, I like all religions. I, I, I like Buddhism. I like Christianity. I myself am a Christian, but I like all religions without exception, apart from atheism. And I still respect atheists. I still respect them. Even if I don't agree with them, I don't think they have anything to say. Anyway, so Tanya walked in. The next day and that just changed my life I, I used to think i knew everything and now i realize i know about that much and it's really university is really only the first step on a very tall ladder so it's just meeting tanya um and that that changed my life really and ever since then i've been uh, interested in hermetics and i spent my life dedicating hermetic works and then eventually was conferred with the honors of a master's degree and that was on Apuleius' is the day of Socrates, where he discusses spirits in the ancient world or daimones in ancient Greek, compared to my translation of the Corpus Semeticum and a close look at the ancient uh, languages. Brilliant, brilliant. It's a that's a pretty exceptional background you have with archaeology and then going into the classical literature and and just by happen chance you were able to meet Tanya Robinson of Falcon Books Publishing, and uh, and then and was introduced into down the rabbit hole so to say yeah very much like the matrix yeah yeah totally. yeah yeah and um and what brought you to collaborating with falcon books and and tanya and and uh, nanad Speak, she needed an editor at that time the uh she'd just taken on the nad in 2016 i met her in 2017 i think it was and she needed an editor and she also needed someone that was interested and knowledgeable about magic so at the time I was the only editor for the firm. I was um, uh, only just starting out. So I'd never had an editing job before and I wasn't a particularly good editor because it was my first editing job. But since then I've edited for other companies like I edited for a, a Chinese company that does academic literature and uh, various authors that want their books published and they don't really have a good grasp of syntax or, la or uh, grammar and understanding Latin really helps with that. Um, but to be honest, editing is, is okay. You know, it's, it's all right. It's just, that was just the doorway actually just becoming aware of who Franz Baden was. And I, I always read the Corpus Semeticum. I always read the golden verses of Pythagoras and, and writers like Iamblichus and Plato and uh, Pythagoras and stuff. And, and so I was already on that path anyway. It was just meeting Tanya and the other magicians, the Nad. Um, that really opened my mind, uh, to, to this whole other world which is out there. A whole other world that's out there. And and it's so vast. And you need to be able to explore this whole other world, both through contemporary authors like Barden or, or Nanad or folks who are under Tanya's company, Falcon Books, but also classical ones that are maybe less explored or, or have their stones less unturned. Uh, well, one thing you were mentioning to me earlier was that Greek and Latin terms, and maybe it was just classical Latin, that, that there can be 10, 20, 30 different interpretations of, of a word. And because of that, as a translator, it's a it's you, it's you like dutifully you have to think about whether you you connect with something esoterically and get to the, the cusp of the energy that's being transmitted or as exoterically, like where it can be understood by a general audience. And so I'm curious about how that's been in your process uh, as an editor, as a translator, um, or as someone who's delving into these works in great depth. 
I'd, I'd love to discuss this. This is really nerdy. And um, whereas I used to do a lot more kind of meditation and out of body experiences when I was first getting into this in college, when I was like 17, as I've got older, I've got more into the kind of scholarly side of it. And honestly, man, it's, it's, it's incredible. So like take one word, say like wis in Latin. Now wis is where we get the word vim from in English. And it means like power, but to the Romans, it meant like physical force. But it also means a force of nature. It's also female. This is female. So even though it's a, a kind of force, it's actually feminine. And it also could be translated as energy. And there are very many words like this. Like if I just pick up one book, this is a, a dictionary of ancient Greek. And in one, one of the entries, it goes on for about 10 pages. For just one word, it goes on for about 10 pages. So that gives you an idea. Some words like prepositions and conjunctions and things like that, like even certain pronouns, they only have a certain meaning, um, but it's verbs, verbs quite often, and, co and common nouns can often have a very different meaning. And even when you're translating a proper noun, quite often you'll find the names of the winds in, in the ancient text, but that happens with a lot of texts. So whereas um, in English we would say, oh, east, over there they would say, um, Volturnus or Boreas or, or, or Africus. So they will actually invoke the winds to, to, so they won't say, oh, that's east. They'll, or they'll say that's north. They'll say that's the god Boreas. Or they'll say that's Hyperborea. That's beyond the north wind and things like that. So it's really difficult to know um, sometimes uh, whether you just translate it as east or whether you mean this is an invocation of the god of the eastern wind. And there are loads of examples like that. And they're all over the corpus somaticum. We're really only just scratching the surface of what there is underneath there. Um, it's, it's, it's so deep. I mean, it's, it's so deep. It's unbelievable. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's really deep. And, and it makes me wonder about when people are spelling things, when they're creating sentences, what types of spells are they casting? Um, that may have some etymological roots towards Greek or Latin or Germanic languages um, or anything that, because when you speak of the directions and how the classically they're, they're, they invoke the gods that were associated with said direction or the said wind of that direction, that makes me wonder what else are we invoking? Oh, there's, there's loads. There's loads. There's, there's one book which you can't even buy. Uh, you can't even read on the internet. You can only buy it. And it's by a guy called Macrobius, and it's called Saturnalia, which is like the pagan Christmas. And it's philosophical discussion. And a lot of these guys, and he was probably a Christian Macrobius because he was at a very high position. But at the same time, a lot of these guys, they'd been trained in the pagan kind of way. So they had both. They weren't dogmatic like we are today. And um, in one of the books, he discusses a, a genius Loki of Rome. And th he says that it was the death penalty for anyone who disclosed the true name of Rome. And even in the writings of Gaius Plinius Secundus Maior, that's the older, Pliny the Elder, you, he corroborates this by saying, yeah, a guy was given the secret name of the god of Rome, which was the palindrome of Roma. So get the word Roma, R-O-M-A, then turn it round. What have you got? Amor. Amor. Love. 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 And that was the secret name of Rome, and it wasn't called Rome or Roma, it was called love, and that's how you invoke the genius. But if anybody spoke about this, they would get killed. And so they used to call it Romanus instead, which is why it's Senatus Populusque Romanus, not Roma. Um, so that, that's the, yeah, and that's one example. Another example is in 1346, much later in history, as a uh, medieval grimoire only recently been rediscovered. It was used by John Dee. He was the guy that dated it. And that's called the Summa Sacrae Magicae, written by a guy called Barangario Gunnell. And in the opening of that book, it hasn't been translated, it's only in Latin. He talks about the word. And he talks about a bit almost like a kind of magical version of the Bible, uh, that this is a sacred thing. In the beginning was the word, in principio erat verbum. And he, he talks about grammar and dialectic and spelling and really ties words into to magic. Yeah, so that's that's the so Macrobius is Saturnalia and Berengario Ganel's Height of Sacred Magic. Mm. Yeah, that's that's it's difficult to go off of that because it's just like it's a can of worms. Like there's so many ways with places we could explore with 
with the language and how powerful that is. Like I had ne never connected that realm between a more, and that's a, that's pretty phenomenal. Like yeah. there, there's a death sentence for that. Yeah, there was in the first century BCE. Yeah, first century BCE. One thing I one thing I th spoke about with another guest recently, Peter Dushman, um, uh, and he's he's the founder of Meta Magic. He like we we went at length of talking about ca the calendar system and the, and the Greg Gregorian calendar system, <clears throat> and how and how like the calendar systems that we create for societies is also the it's, it's also the energetic. Um, pattern that we set as a precedence for the culture in perpetuity and so like the ties have a tie calendar there's a lunar calendar and, and pre most any, pretty much all cultures uh and and uh and muslims have their their lunar calendar i'm um, so wondering like if, if there's any calendar systems that you've explored like was it what was there like different calendars in, in ancient times between cultures yes. Yes, very much. Uh, the, the Greeks had a kind of heliotropic lunar calendar, a mixture of the, um, the, 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 the sun and the moon. So it's quite difficult to understand the Greek calendar because each Greek city-state has their own form of reckoning. So we only look at the Athenians because most of the manuscripts and fragments which survive, not the archaeology, the manuscripts, they're, they're from ancient Athens. The Romans did great things. They used to have 10 months. Today itself is Julius Caesar. It is leap year today it's the 29th of february so um that was the gregorian calendar which is in about the mid 16th century and the best source for that is a guy called bead the venerable bead he wrote a book on how to calculate and there was a big controversy in the middle ages of when people were trying to discover um when it was easter and there was a big controversy there's one guy who's a, um, a ukrainian uh, living in la he's a he's a nice guy he he's he's just recently writ writing a book about he he reckons he's found the true birth date of Jesus in the writings of Firmicus Maternus, and he reckons Jesus was born on the summer solstice, and that it was a huge cover-up uh, to keep the keep the pagans uh, suppressed because they used to worship on Saturnalia, which is the 25th of uh, December, and also Mithraism was also the 25th of December. But that's a different thing entirely. In terms of hermetic magic, I think it's very important, the calendar, because it tells us, and there's a line in the Picatrix, which is a, a work written in classical Arabic in the 11th century, and it's the difference between a true magician and someone that's just pretending to be a magician is someone that knows the calendar, that knows that at five degrees Aries that this is a particular day that you summon this particular head, and that's when it will be most strongest. However, in the Nad's recent book, and they'll probably crucify me for saying this, but um, apparently when you become really advanced, like Victoria, for example, you can just summon them. But you don't need, it's only for beginners that have to use the calendar, that eventually once you have enough rapport and you, you meet these spirits often enough, they kind of like you and so they look out for you. And so if you summon them, they will just appear. It doesn't have to be on a, a particular day, but to start with, it's important. And that is crucial for the esoteric synthesis of astrology, as Franz Barden called it. Mm. For the esoteric synthesis of no astrology did i hear that correctly yep that's oh. what it's written in practice of magical evocation or at least in translation my german is not great i only speak french latin and ancient greek french latin ancient greek hmm. cool and so and so what are some terms from greek or latin um that you find have a lot of power imbued in them either phrases or or specific words that are like either they're almost like incantations or they're almost spells or they themselves carry like really powerful energy. What you're, you you're probably not going to believe this, but in there is a, there is a book on black magic called, you may, you may have even read it called the, the, the key of Solomon, the greater key of Solomon. And in that it lists the Psalms from the Bible in Latin that apparently invoke particular deities so they are very powerful and again i shouldn't be talking about this but i'm sure nanad will be fine with it that in uh the the shemham forash uh, magic book there was a lot of latin and gilberto gilberto strapazon as we discussed earlier argues that the shemham forash angels actually like latin as a form of communication so if you ask to me what's a good latin phrase to use which has a lot of power I would say it's actually the Vulgate from the Bible because at the, at the beginning of each of the 72 heads, it has the, the uh, conjuration in Latin and it's from the Bible. That's one example. 
there are other examples. For example, there are two heads in the um, around the Earth zone of the 360. One of them is the head of history, and his is sine iran et dubio, which is without anger or partiality. And it comes from Tacitus's Annals. And if you use that, that will help invoke that angel because it's one of his favorite tags. Um, there's also a line, or um, random pit quod fichet mensana in corpore sanum, which means if I were to pray for anything, or if one were to pray for anything, one should pray for a healthy mind in a healthy body. And that is again um, the maxim, or just mensana in corpore sanum, which is a contraction of it. That's his maxim. So he says we should work on the physical body as well as the mind. But there are others. Um, there are others. Uh, for example, um, we find that, uh, that it's a very brief language, Latin. So you can sometimes use it to communicate with angels because you only need like a handful of words, whereas we use a lot of words in English to say the same thing. So I think for psychic communication, it's also very, very strong. But really images, images, uh, not necessarily the words, but the sigils, they're, I, they're, I think they contain the most power. They contain the most power. Yeah, and, and also, it's it, and from, from what you're saying, I'm constructing an idea that that like English, it takes about twice as long to say something in English as it yep. would in Latin. And yep. then with a sigil or with a symbol, it's almost like that that it's simplified even further, and and it's concentrated. And so, language itself, or with spells or the language that's being used, as that's when it's concentrated, when it's laser like, that's when it's most efficacious. Yes, totally. And even on some medieval sigils, you'll see a little bit of Latin. And quite often that will be abbreviated again, like you're reading, reading an inscription. Sometimes it's full. Um, like Athanasius Kircher in his uh, Oedipus Aegyptiacus, he has a lot of sim symbols and he'll just put one word. And it's always in Latin. And that just sums up everything about that angel. And that word will have like 20 different meanings in English. Mm. Yeah. 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 I'm wondering like if there's some different writing styles or or words that would be used to summarize or characterize pages and ancient scripts. Like I'm wondering what type of linguistic devices that they use, like having like one word that encapsulates the passage and that captures the energy. Because from what you're saying, like the abbreviation, it's just it's not something I found. I don't speak Latin or Greek, but when I've looked at it, when I've when I've scanned the text and look at it, I see there's lots of abbreviations and and shorthand passage for the for a longer passage and so on. Okay, it was actually a guy called Marcus Tullius Cicero, very famous Roman author, probably the most famous Roman apart from Publius Vercellius Maro, who wrote like the Aeneid, which is the the germ the the sort of the Romans' pagan Bible, but Cicero was the best prose author. And even during the Renaissance, they said that he his Latin is just the 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 the, the golden age, it's the high watermark because it's so simple and it's so easy. He doesn't use obscure, strange words. He just speaks clearly, and it's very brief. It's so nice. Anyway, it's his slave actually uh, who came up with shorthand. He was the first guy during the first century BCE. And he, he was, Cicero was talking so much that he thought, crikey, I've got to, I've got to abbreviate this somehow. So he would write a letter and then put a symbol afterwards. And that would then tell you what that letter means. And he was the first to do that. And then all throughout the medieval times, because palimpsests, vellum, inks were so expensive that they had to do that. That if you just read an old manuscript, you can't actually read it. It took me years to learn how to read magical grimoires because they just put a little dash at the end of the word and each of those symbols means something different depending on where it is in the sentence and what letters follow it so i've got these huge manuals next to me and i have to post them up all over the room and constantly look at them to read a text because they're very difficult to read and it's all about the symbols so there is a kind of, it's not a magic i've got to be honest because other hermeticists come in and say oh well they're symbols but really all they are is to save on paper and ink because paper and ink used to be very expensive. So they're not like magical symbols, like in the works of Giordano Bruno or even in the Liber Hermetis or um, works of people like um, uh, in the Picatrix is another one. We'll show you symbols and they're real magical symbols. But what we see is just scribal abbreviation and that goes back to Cicero. Mm. That goes back to Cicero. 
Yeah, there's lots of uh, there's a lot lots of lots of synapses in my brain are connecting right now between between not just centuries but that was millennia apart. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, that's what makes it so much fun to talk about the classics, as, as it contextualizes so many different things. It's, yeah, uh, I'll so be honest. Different. I don't think Latin is that strong uh, uh, in terms of the. If you look at other ancient languages like Hebrew, classical Arabic, ancient Greek then they have a much stronger ancient magical tradition. But Latin was very strong during the Renaissance. So you find people like Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa von Nettisheim wrote a book called De Occulta Philosophia, On Occult Philosophy. And that's a beautiful book. And it's still used by hermetic practitioners today. So it's really, really the Renaissance was the, the big upsurge of, of magic. So I went to a party once and I was reading some Latin poetry. It was a love poem to a woman. And one guy thought I was going to turn him into a frog. And he said, stop doing that. You're going you're to cast a spell on me. And I was like, look, man, it's just a piece of love poetry. I'm not, I'm not trying to turn anybody into a frog. But it has that Harry Potter reputation, which is not really deserved. Because if you study Hebrew or you study ancient Greek or you study the Patricks in classical Arabic, it's a lot deeper than anything in Latin. A lot deeper. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's fascinating. There's so much more to learn linguistically about systems and, and how spells spelling and and classic language systems are so deeply intertwined and, I, and it's something that's definitely well overlooked in, in modernity the the deep implication and connection between spell casting and the words that were said and spoken in ancient times um and the, how the writing between the connection between writing and and uh and, and sorcery soothsaying and and, and creating theor theoretically. Could we um, move on to my research, which is directly related to this? Because much like saying the word Roma Amor would lead to a death sentence, the guy who wrote this book, he was actually up on trial for practicing magic, and his trial survives. And you read it, and the first time I read it, I just thought, how much about magic does this guy actually know? And he knows quite a lot. And you start thinking, maybe he's guilty. Maybe he did practice magic. But I don't think he practiced like evil magic because he wasn't a bad guy. He didn't even want to marry this girl that, that he ended up marrying to. It's because a friend of his said, oh, um, uh, you, you want to marry my sister because she's a spinster. She's getting old. She's got loads of money. He's like, I don't care. I've already got money because they were already like aristocrats and stuff. And he's, he's like, look, come on, just go with my sister. She'll it'll make her happy. And she's like, OK. And then her brothers lost a lot of money because in ancient times, it all went to the man. So the woman would be cut out of a lot of the inheritance. So they tried to say, oh, he's a witch. We need to put him on trial. And then he did this wonderful oration, and it is magnificent. And he just defends magic in the court. He said, I am in the company of Plato. I am in the company of Aristotle. What we're talking about here is living a philosophical life. We're talking about the good, the true, the one. And he... He really bigs up magic. And my, my research was into spirits or daimones in a book called De Deo Socrates. It's a very rare book. Nobody ever really reads it because they tend to read his novel, which is all about magic. Um, and that's called The Metamorphoses. And he falls in love with a witch and she turns him into an animal. And then he goes on a mad adventure and gets kidnapped by like bandits and then ends up meeting a princess. He gets transformed back. He marries her. They live happily ever after. And then he converts to the goddess Isis. And then he goes through an initiation, magical initiation ceremony, and he's just about to go through it. And then he has to say, I have to stop now, reader, because if I mention anything else, they're going to kill me. And so it is very much my research was on secret societies um, in the ancient world. It was on the constraints, and it wasn't just physical constraints. In the writings of Iamblichus, there were even divine constraints for using these words. So it's, it's a really deep subject. Sorry, go on. You were going to say something. I can tell. Well, what matters now is learning more about these secret societies. So you, you have me and everyone else intrigued. Okay, well, there isn't actually a lot of evidence for it. There's a guy called Christian H. Bull who wrote a wonderful book called Hermes Trismegistus, the Egyptian Priest of Greek Wisdom. No, the Greek Priest of Egyptian Wisdom or something like that, the Hellenic Priest. And there's a chapter in his book where he talks about the evidence for ancient secret societies. And there is some. 
in Alexandria, in Egypt, in the second century AD. We find a lot of groups who are from Jewish backgrounds, they're from pagan backgrounds, they're from Christian backgrounds, and they're all getting along together. It's a bit like when the Abbasids moved into um, Toledo or Granada. You had people from all faiths, scholars, magicians, coming together and discussing these ideas without any kind of stigma or, or, or thing like that. So anyway, he reckons it wasn't a rigid, strict secret society like we think of today, like the Illuminati or any of the other secret societies. He said it was basically a bunch of vegetarian um, practitioners who did meditation. And there are other scholars that, that suggest that it was kind of like a reading club, that they would have, share magical books between each other and say, hey, check this one out. Check that. So, so it was more like kind of living in San Francisco or, or L.A. rather than like living in a really strict Victorian London, you know. It's uh, that's that's what I compare it with. So it's more like kind of cool, like a cool yeah. society, you know. The San Francisco hippies vibe of the ancient world. Yeah, well, I really look up to that. It's my favorite place in, in America, California. I've always wanted to go there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's maybe not going now until it's sorted out. <laughs> if it was well, twenty years ago, for sure, for sure. Right? Yeah, I kind of have a lot of to do. Well, you grew up there. Uh, I I would visit there uh, every year. Uh, well, so you're from California. There. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. From the from the West Coast, of the United States. Yeah, no oh, sunshine state. Wicked. Wow, awesome. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I keep on asking more about these secret societies. What What other secret societies do you know about that we may not well, know? Um. Like, for example, there's there's a scholar, and her name is Emily Wilson. She did uh, the only translation of Homer's Odyssey done by a woman in the history of thing, and she's really good. She's an amazing translator. She's almost as good at translating as I am. She's getting there. Anyway, she wrote a book called The Death of Socrates. And in that book, it discusses, um, they use uh, um, uh, irony. They use irony to, to convey secret messages. So Plato, um, or Socrates rather, will be delivering a lecture. And he'll do it in a kind of witty way. So that the people that are in this sort of loop, that are part of these secret societies, they'll pick up on it because they understand the nuances and there's a kind of subtext there that you never say, you're never allowed to say it, but you kind of pick up on the vibe. And then the other people are just there looking at the face value of the thing. And it was done through, um, through uh, irony, through irony. And there's even a line in the De Deo Socrates, which uh, is quite ironic. And I picked up on this in my masters and they said, look, th this guy's definitely being ironic here. Um, so they do it through comedy actually that you just kind of laugh and it would be kind of fun but underneath there would be a sort of secret message that would be conveyed to people because it was all kept totally tight there's even laws against it there's a thing called the 12 tables and there's a fragment in the writings of Pliny that says if anybody's caught practicing magic um trying to curse someone's crops then they will be killed and there's another beautiful ritual um found in the writings of Cato which is a book on farming and he describes in graphic detail how to get a good harvest through invoking the gods. And he actually explicitly explains a magical spell. And this is on a book on farming. I don't know if you know, but Mars is the god of farming. He's also the god of um, not communication, because that's Hermes or Mercury, but he's the sort of god of diplomacy. So a lot of people think of Mars only as war. But in the Nads book recently, he says a lot of astrologers tend to overlook the softer sides of Mars. Um, so, yeah, there, there, are, there is evidence of secret societies, but it seems to be done in a kind of humor, uh, a humoristic way. So they make light of it and then they move on. But really, there's secret esoteric stuff being transmitted between them. Um, probably the most famous example, which I gave to you earlier, which is not humorous, was Aristotle and Alexander the Great. And Alexander said to Aristotle, you can't let this book be profaned by the masses because this is supposed to be secret knowledge. To be honest, I've read it and I can't stand the bloody book. I, I much prefer his politics or I prefer his ethics because it talks about how to improve your character. The metaphysics is a very difficult book to read. And the translator, I think it's Hamilton, um, under Laws Tancred at the beginning, he said he had to make a conscious choice whether he translates this exoterically or esoterically so that's an example of secret books that that were taboo in the ancient world that they weren't for everybody mm, they weren't for everybody 
And it makes me wonder too, uh, one, one about anachronisms and in other words, how we see these events happening as people of the 21st century and the interpretations that arise from that. Um, I'm I'm wondering about low a type. What are some places where we may make dangerous anachronistic thoughts or projections onto the past and how we we interpret it may have happened? Um, how does that how does that work for either magical text or or for just translation and understanding his story in, in general in general? Uh, I have to be careful about how much I can say about this uh, because I don't want to come across as a total woo woo fruitcake. But um, there is a line in the Corpus Semeticum. It's actually in Asclepius, I think it's chapter 11, where it talks about um, a gain of function uh, disease that was created by man. And it also talks about huge wildfires. Now, in 2020, year of the rat, which is also pestis in Latin, pestis means rat and it also means plague. And in the Chinese zodiac, it was the year of the rat. It doesn't actually specifically state gain of function. It just talks about the disease that you made, essay, which means you are, you are the, you made this disease. And they're talking to man. The God is talking to man and saying, you made this disease. You, you created this. And in the same line, it talks about all these wildfires that are going to go everywhere across the world. And this is in a prophecy. This is in a prophecy. Now, this is in the Corpus Semeticum. It's in chapter 11 of the Asclepius. And I just found it interesting. I was reading this as I was translating it. And then two years later all of this stuff happened and you know it's about one year later and i just thought wow you know hermes trismegistus predicted these things like thousands of years ago and this might not be the only plague that the world has seen but it's certainly the first man-made plague because it, the wuhan institute of virology i'm not a conspiracy theorist i swear i'm not a conspiracy theorist but james woods he had a um a twitter feed and he said look this is where the virus was first found. And this is where the Institute of Virology, and they were right next to each other. So he said, I'm not a conspiracy theorist because I'm not, but I'm very open-minded. And it does seem strange how a lot of stuff went missing, like a lot of science data just completely disappeared from there. And there's no scientific reason that would be done to delete those files. In fact, that's the only way you can cure it is by getting its genetic sequence and things. So, so I just found it interesting how in the Asclepius, Hermes Trismegistus seems to have predicted that there was going to be a huge rise in global temperatures and fires all over California, Canada, Greece, Crete, Australia. I mean, you've seen the wildfires. They're all over, man. I mean, in the summer, we don't see it now so much in winter, but last year was terrible. And also this, and there's another There's another text. Um, I was translating a text called The, the Troades by a guy called Lucius Anaios Seneca. He's the greatest tra tragic poet playwright. And he's, he writes a play about um, women, and it's all about this woman, Cassandra, who is like a crazy kind of prophetess. And in the opening scene, it talks about troops moving into the Crimea and then moving in across the Dnipro River into Ukraine. And they talk about like Muscovites from Scythia crossing the Black Sea. So I think there were prophecies in the ancient world that were that are only now really being rediscovered. That, um, that Hermes Trismegistus, I believe he knew this was going to happen. And there are probably been many Hermeses, actually. You are Hermes. I am Hermes. We are all. Uh, there are many incarnations of, of Hermes. You know, it's like a kind of a spirit that runs through all Hermeticists. And it's encapsulated in the emerald tablet of Hermes that we are each uh, fragments of this, um, well, facets of this great magical force that uh, transcends comprehension, the ineffable God. Mm. Mm. Uh, I'd like to know a little bit of you about your thoughts with, uh, with how the Ar Aristotelians used humor and irony in order to subdue their message away from the masses, but also it also was a vehicle for them to have a parallel society almost like having okay. society within society. I'd like yeah. to know if there was any um, different types of parallel societies historically that may be of interest and also what foreshadowing in the future, like in, in today's age or in the future, how par these types of parallel societies and, and these types of ways of, of alternative ways of being may happen in future with with how hectic and chaotic things are 
and how they'll continually get worse. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's a very interesting point, and I, I, I know that the way is um, the world's going is not a particularly nice way, but it's our duty as as hermeticists and being mindful to try and um, maintain peace within our own realms and just kind of dial things down and just think, well, okay, it's not quite that bad yet, so let's just keep on keeping on, be a very British kind of step up a lip. But with regards to your question, um, yes, actually, it was Plato. It was Plato, not Aristotle, even though um, Plato and Aristotle were both taught by Socrates, um, that it, it's it, it's um, in the writings of Iamblichus, and it's in a very, very interesting book called the, On the Mysteries of Egypt. And he discusses that, and he says, look, it's okay for you to use Plato's works as a vehicle in a an ironic way to transmit these texts. But with the Pythagoreans... They tended to be a lot stricter with um, that, like they weren't allowed to write anything down. For example, Pythagoras never wrote anything down, right? And his whole school didn't write anything down. As a result, we it's a complete loss for us classicists because we rely on people like Iamblichus, who was like fourth century AD, and yet Pythagoras was like six hundred BC or so. So it's like a thousand years prior to that. We have another writer called Porphyry who also left a biography of, of Pythagoras. And, and anyway, in On the Egyptian Mysteries by Amblichus, he says, yeah, it's cool to use Plato's works as a vehicle for transmitting esoteric knowledge, but just be careful about what you say because it can not only have physical consequences, but also divine consequences. We get a few other traces of this, like in Macrobius' Saturnalia, when he's discussing a passage of Virgil's Aeneid, where they talk about going to Hades through using a magical ritual and going under the under to the underworld they say you must never profane this this is knowledge to be used only by uh the the the, the secret society i mean i guess they had a, a, a kind of we, we don't know much about it because you weren't even allowed to write anything down but he does mention this difference between the sacred and the profane so it's a bit like when you read the bible and they say speak in parables you know um that it's our duty i think to just not just lay everything out on the table we can say most everything because there's nothing to be ashamed of here most of them were vegetarians for example the last line in the corpus semeticum is don't eat animals right there is even a book by porphyry that's called on abstinence it's like a, a guidebook of how to eat really well and have a diet they were pythagoreans weren't even allowed to touch fish for example they thought it was dirty and even beans were were frowned upon because they were seen as allegories of engaging in politics. And according to Pythagoreans, we should not engage in politics. We should abstain from any of that because politics is a path of daggers and it's a, a corrupt path. There were other authors that said, no, we should engage in politics. People like Cicero. He said, no, there's nothing wrong with politics. But Cicero was a politician. So uh, anyway, um, yeah, so it, it's it, it, I, I think the 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 irony thing is is more kind of being treated by modern scholars more than um than it is it it, does, it doesn't it's not really apparent if you were to just read plato in english you wouldn't even pick up on it it's only if you read it in ancient greek and you get like a word play you get the the words play on each other like you would in some languages and and that's it's it's not really even funny because you read it and you think, what's so funny about that? If you're reading like a, a bawdy play about women or something, you might quite laugh. You know, there's a lovely skit by a guy called um, Seneca called Apocolicintosis, which is the pumpkin, pumpkinification of the Emperor Claudius. And it's about when Claudius goes out of body and goes to the heavens and then meets the gods and they'll take the mickey out of him because he was such an awful emperor. But um, but yeah, so there isn't much humor in the ancient world in philosophy, but that's that was the vehicle, I believe, from my research uh, that they used to transmit esoteric knowledge that was otherwise kept secret or dangerous knowledge. So what are some projects you see yourself working on in the future related to, you know, like teaching or a platform or or translations books what are what are some things you're exploring or projects you're looking to forward to in the future thanks jake i'm glad you asked this and this might be a good way to end the interview actually because uh, it's been going on a while now um yeah well my 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 basics my focus is on 
at the moment getting my master's degree research. So that's looking at guiding spirits in the philosophical Hermetica as compared with Deo Socrates. And that will be a translation of Deo Socrates. It's a very expensive book. It's about 150 pounds. It's this book here. And I bought this for 150 pounds and I thought, man, I could translate that. And so I'm selling it for 10. Yeah. And so I, I'm just going to get the same book and it's in English. And it's got all of this information in here, plus a load more. Um, it's because I think academic publishers, they, they charge way too much money. They're greedy. So I just think, you know, I'm a working guy. I'm doing unskilled labor jobs most of my life. So I'm going to sell the same book for like 10, 15 pounds. Uh, so that's one project I'm working on. The other one I've done is The Prophecies of Merlin. I've translated those from John of Cornwall and from Geoffrey of Monmouth. And that uh, comes as a part of the history Historia Britonium by Nennis, but that's like a history project. And then my latest project, um, which is probably more to do with geopolitics and the state of the world, was I was um, looking at Yevgeny Prigozhin, and I couldn't believe how he turned on Moscow and just like started attacking the Kremlin. I thought no one does this because Putin's a total dictator. And even if you don't like Putin, it's wise to fear him because he's anyone who's spoken out against him, whether you're a journalist or a spy, you just end up dead. You fall out of a window. That's how he operates, right? And I was fascinated. I thought, wow, maybe in the ancient world, there was somebody who did this. And I've been looking and there was nobody in the ancient world who made hot dogs in St. Petersburg. He ended up as the king's chef, was the king's favorite, and then basically turned around and bit his owner's hand and then died two months later to the day in a plane crash. No one, there was what one guy called Sargon of Akkad, very famous a uh, person in Mesopotamia, he came from nothing and he ended up taking out the king and taking his place. But I'm writing a book about private military companies in ancient Greece and to, comparing them to today and looking at human rights abuses and humanitarian law because that's something I've studied at university and something that I'm interested in. But I understand that's a dangerous project because there have been three um, journalists who wrote about the Wagner Group and they all died that same week after they release their book. So I'm having to write it from a respectful point of view, not passing any judgments. I'm not the International Court of Justice. I'm not persecuting them for war crimes. It's just looking at their loyalty and their effectiveness. But that's kind of like a side thing. My main focus, my first publication is um, Spirits in the Ancient World. So that's a translation of Apuleius to Deo Socrates with a heavy emphasis on the hermetics. So that, I hope that answers your question. So it's mainly publishing. Yeah, mainly publishing. Yeah, yeah, and I suppose if you have any more projects in the future, then uh, then then where where can readers or viewers, listeners, either get in contact with you, follow your social media videos, uh, any any projects that you have up and coming? Well, well, I used to be a musician, so I used to have a lot of um, videos up on YouTube, and I got involved with a big copyright despite about them because there was an old tune from America in like the 1900s, really early, and there was a big thing with RCA Records and they wanted to me to pay money for this tune which is written like hundreds of years ago and and I said no this is this is not right so I got a big force I haven't been doing much YouTube but now I do kind of audio books I do have a, a Facebook page called Max Latham Latin Translator you can get in touch with me on that but to be honest uh, I'm I'm thinking more of becoming like a social commentator on geopolitics and I invite you to do a a podcast on geopolitics and the state of the world and the human condition, how we might be able to make it better. You know, how yeah, we could, yeah, I well, love yeah. I'm thinking about that too. And uh, as, as some other person we, I've spoken with too on the podcast, also has a high inclination and interest in that same field. So, cool. we'll see, we'll see. Cool. Well, uh, thanks for having me. I'll, I'll have to come up with a name first, though. And okay. Uh, and then we'll see from there. So that's, okay. Well, that, well, that, well, well, well we'll uh, storyboard it and just see what, what happens. Sounds Thanks for great. having me on the show, man. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. We'll talk soon. Okay. God bless.